What's going on? Why are you bigger than me? Hey, I love I love the end ending of that intro there. A bit of the the stab. So, Mar Maria, I was I was half expecting I would come back this week and I would have been punted. You'd have found another a much better co-host than me after me being away for the past two weeks. That's why I didn't risk having anybody else. You see, I thought if I don't have anybody else, I'll miss you. But if you know if they if they're brilliant, I'm you know so you're lucky because you, nobody's indispensable, you know. But I did miss you. I did, honestly. Oh, my my heart is yeah. That that's, that means a lot to me. Thank you, Maria. And um, you were in Italy, weren't you? Ah, oh, fantastic. You know, thankfully my my uh, my shirt still fits me after all that wonderful pasta as well but um yeah so uh we've got a really cool show for you today we have a great uh, guest great speaker rachel monda now rachel monda helps people tell their story in a way that they've not told it before working with them on finding and crafting their stories for greater engagement greater impact and ultimately more business as speaking became a more and more significant part of her business model and challenged to share more of her story, Rachel found herself held back by a belief that she didn't have a story to share. This set her on a path to see the value in her own stories and to find a way to bring ordinary everyday stories to her speaking. An experienced coach and trainer, she has developed a unique and simple story craft process to help others do the same. She is an active member of the London branch of the PSA, the Professional Speaking Association. And in 2022, she will become regional president. Please welcome her to the show today. Yay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hang on, let's me do, I had to do the swapping. StreamYard does this. I'm going to complain to StreamYard. <laughs> welcome, Rachel, how are you? I'm very well, Maria. Great to be here. Thank you. And, and nice to meet you, James, at last. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. I'm show. sure his, his reputation will have gone before him. Um, so listen, Rachel, I, I want to start because you actually started your speaking career in a courtroom, which is a very odd place to start a speaking career. Tell me about that and tell me how that is relevant to what you're doing now. OK, I mean, it started off because very originally I was working with juvenile offenders Um that was therefore that took me into the juvenile courtroom to speak on behalf of the social services department basically and my first sort of thing was I literally might have one sentence to say at the point that the magistrate would say and what is the social services view on this um, and I found that absolutely terrifying to begin Aww. with however I kind of gathered my confidence and once I really got to understand the whole process uh, fast forward, of, you know, four or five years from there, and I was actually working in the legal department for Southwark Social Services, and I was presenting the care proceedings cases on behalf of the local authority. And it's that bit, really, that has the relevance to what I'm doing now, because in order to present my case, I would have had to do the preparation. I would have had to talk to the various witnesses that I'd be calling and helping them put their statement together of what they were going to say in the courtroom. And it would be listening to the whole story, but knowing which bits to focus on and which bits to pick out. And that's kind of what I do with my clients now. You know, I'll sit down with a new client and say, right, I've got my notepad here. Tell me your story um, right from day one. And then I'll go back through and say, right, these are the key bits and of course, that would have been emphasised in the courtroom because I would then be listening to the uh, witnesses called by the other parties and doing the same thing, but in reverse, just sort of focusing into the bits that I felt that, you know, maybe I could challenge them on um, and that kind of thing. So it was that, list, that laser focus, I guess, on the stories and the ability to pick out the key bits that, that, that is relevant to what I'm doing now. I love that. I love the fact that you take the positive to support what you needed, but you then listen and pick up the stuff that actually would, again, support you from the other side. I imagine you'd be very um, difficult to win an argument with. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'd like to think so, but um, I get to a certain point with an argument. I think, actually, I'm just going to back down now because I'm never going to convince somebody Um but I, I certainly, I won't necessarily keep the argument going. 
but I will stop it because I can see that um, there is no, there is there's no mileage in it. Um, I, I won't keep going till the bitter end because uh, so often th th there's no point. But in the courtroom, it's a different thing because you mm. are presenting the story for the panel of people, i.e. the magistrates, to make their decision. Um, so it's a slightly different thing than, than having an argument or a debate with one other person. Mm. So I'm guessing, like, you think about top barristers, they're, they're working, they're kind of professionals on shaping stories, shaping narratives. Yeah. Um, so why would an experienced, uh, it could be a speaker or a presenter or even a barrister, why would they even need help to tell their story? Um, what I find is that when it's your own story, um, people are often too absorbed in it to know where the good place to start is. Um, particularly people that are new to sharing their stories. And, and that might be somebody that's been speaking for years, but just hasn't shared a personal story, perhaps because they felt too vulnerable to share it before. Um, maybe it, it's something that, you know, maybe a shift in their business model that now a new story is, is more relevant, that they're not always in the most objective position to to see where is a really, really good point to actually start the presentation, because it's all about that engaging the audience literally from the first words that come out of your mouth. And although experienced speakers will know that, because they're part of the story, they won't necessarily see that objectively. But it's also, I think, um, been my experience, that a lot of people take their audience down rabbit holes because they'll tell a little bit of a side story that actually isn't relevant to the key message they're tell the, of their presentation. Um, and again, because it's their story, it was an important bit to them, but it's about keeping them on track of thinking, well, does, it, does this part of the story support the message you want your audience to go away with? It reminds me a little bit, I think it was Jim Cathcart, he always, he, uh, a great speaker from America, I remember doing an event in Singapore that he was doing as well, and he said, you know, whenever you're, you're, if you're giving this kind of story, 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 you should all, it's always like story, story, and here's what this means for you. Yes. It has to, it has to kind of relate, mm. or, or the Miles Davis version, the so what. Okay, so what? Yeah. So you, so you, you say yeah. what you've told me. That, that thing about the, the personal, and I guess now I'm just kind of speaking now for, for professional speakers, you know, maybe uh, that are out there as well, where they're maybe they're really on top of their content. They really know their, their story, their, their, the, the, the content side, the, the topic that they speak on, but they feel uncomfortable about sharing more personal stories. And I'm, I'm saying this now, you're in the UK, I'm in the UK. Some of our American colleagues are much easier at sharing those stories. And sometimes it can feel a little bit like a therapy session on, on stage sometimes. Us Brits, we can hold a little bit of that stuff back. So any tips on how to get that balance right where, so you're maybe, you're sharing and it's useful, but it's not kind of oversharing, I guess. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's all sorts of things that come in to, to play there, James. I mean, there's the old sort of adage that, you know, you speak from the wound, uh, speak from the scar rather, not from the wound. So oh, nice. it absolutely should never be a therapy session for your speaking, through your speaking. Um, also, you mentioned that, you know, different cultures have different angles of sharing. As we all know, it's always got to be about the audience. So thinking about, you might be speaking um, as a as a somebody from the UK, but if you're speaking to an American audience, you might choose to share a bit more. But if you were speaking to a different audience, you might share even less. But it's also about um, finding a way of alluding to your story. So, you know, often people will say to me, but I want to share the story because I can see the value that it could have to help other people that have perhaps been through something similar. But there'll be all sorts of reasons why they don't want to share. It might be fear of judgment. Um, it might be that they don't want to implicate somebody who, who is still alive or indeed is no longer with us, but, you know, their friends and relatives are. And it, it's finding a way of alluding to what's gone on so that the audience get an idea without really knowing um, just to give you one example, one of my clients, um, I mean, she came out with this herself completely naturally because we, we were debating how much of her story, which was that she was seriously abused as a very young child. And she said, well, there's no question for me because I can't remember anything about my very early childhood because I've hidden it away. 
Um, and in a sense, I said, well, that's the perfect thing to say then, because anybody else who has experienced something quite similar to that will know exactly what you're talking about. And everybody else will know not to go there, but they'll kind of understand where you're coming from. So sometimes it's enough to allude to it. Where it implicates other people, sometimes the key is to focus on what you felt and what you experienced. So if, say, it's a question of bullying at work and that's the story, rather than perhaps using that terminology, just talk about things that were going on at work that made you feel whatever it was that made you feel so that you're not pointing fingers at other people. You're not using labels. Um, you're not calling it bullying, which is a kind of subjective phrase anyway, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so just finding ways of your audience getting an understanding of what was going on, because they'll create pictures. We all do that, don't we? We fill in, the, fill in the blanks, really. Yeah, exactly. And we will all do that based on our own experience. So as I say, those that have experienced something similar will be right there with you very close to the bullseye. And the others will just kind of know about it because they've heard about it. I like that. That's really good. That's that's. I've learned something really useful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so our title here is Using Stories to Get More Business. And I'm sure our viewers will be saying, OK, give me some juice on that. And you say that as business owners and business leaders and, and speakers, because we have our own businesses as speakers, too, we should be sharing certain stories. What are the stories we should be sharing? I think the first story we should share is the story of how we came to be doing what we're doing. And this is the one where people often say, oh, but it's so ordinary and boring. I always wanted to be a solicitor. And guess what? I did the right GCSEs, the right A-levels and the degree, and now I am a solicitor. But whatever it is, whatever that journey was, whether it was that sort of straightforward or not, there's always the journey towards doing what you do now. Um, and that will inspire other people that are perhaps thinking of making a change. And this is where these sort of ordinary, boring stories can be really valuable, because when we're listening to the big mountain climbing, ocean rowing stories and, and not devaluing those at all, because they are amazing. And if that is your story, you should absolutely use it. But they can also create a gap. I know myself, if I sit in the audience and somebody has done something amazing physically and they're trying to inspire me towards greater resilience and whatever, I let myself off the hook by thinking, yeah, but if, if you've done all that, you've clearly got something in you that I don't have, don't necessarily want to have. So therefore, that kind of lets me off the hook. But when it's somebody that you see is pretty similar to you and you they have done something, it's like, oh, actually... Maybe I could try that. And it's that small, a, a turning point that you're looking for with your audience, I would suggest. You know, some might go, yes, I'm for that. I'm going to start work on it tomorrow. But if what you can just achieve is that hmm, maybe I could try that, then it's that step by step inspiration and, and making a big difference. It's a difference that you probably will never know that you've made to anybody because by the time they've done what you have done, they've probably forgotten that they were inspired by you in the first place. But the point is that you're inspiring people to make the change. That's that's you know, that for me is, is the thing. I don't need to know who I've inspired particularly. I just need to know that people are making changes. So that story of how you came to be doing what you're doing or how the business came to be. I mean, if, if it we're talking about a bigger organisation, um, it would be the founder story. What, what was it that inspired the founder of this company to set it up? Um, so that would be the first one. And, and the next story is why the business does what it does. Where You know, what, what's the heart behind it? And I think that's particularly important now for, um, again, for the bigger organisations, people are being very selective about who they will do business with, whose products and services they will purchase, and which companies they want to go and work for based on the ethics and the values behind the business. So having stories that illustrate those um, are really powerful because then people feel aligned with those goals, um, with those values, and they will bring their business to you rather than a company offering a similar service whose values they don't align with. Um, and the third kind of story is, is your story of what, and these would be your client stories. You know, how, you know, what, what was the problem the client was having? Where were they? What was their 
issue? Why did they come looking for your help in the first place? What was the journey you took them on? So a little bit of your process um, and, and, you know, that transformation and what's the difference you've made? So so those three, the, the how, the why and the what behind your business, whether it's you're a solo entrepreneur or whether you're a multi faceted organization i would say that that those are the stories businesses should be sharing i mean i can see that those stories you would be sharing not only verbally but you'd actually have those on your on your website and maybe yeah. on your social media and you'd be sharing them um i can see the value in that uh, and the why as you said i think it is really important is it also important not only your why why you do it but why it's important for maybe customers to to work with you rather than anybody else is that why important as well um Yes, I guess I guess so. But I think that will come out from the other three stories. Mm. But you might want to pull it out and point it out for them, if you like, just sort of take yeah. them on that final step for sure. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. What, what makes you different? Uh, what makes you different? Mm. And, and usually it is something to do with your story that does make you different or your purpose. So I'm going to rewrite my website. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I may end up being a bit of a devil's advocate here on this, okay. <laughs> but um, you know, so I understand like the going at the why. If you're the, if you're the leader of an organization, and uh, like this is why we're doing it. But I know a lot of people I, I have conversations with. They're not the CEO. They're not mm -hmm. the boss in the organization necessarily in that organization, but they're doing something. And and sometimes I, if I have conversations with them after events or before events, and and they say something like, "Oh, I could never do what you do." Uh, going up there and, and telling stories because they have this imagination that you have to have done something like climbed a mountain or you know, <laughs> you know done something huge. Uh, how how do you convince people to understand that they there's a real value in them sharing their can what they might think as everyday stories but can be transformational to another audience? Yeah, I mean that's exactly the I mean that was my own story in a sense because I felt very. Um, what's the word? I, I don't know, very diminished as a speaker because I recognize that so many successful speakers do have the big story. Um, but you it would be your own personal story of, of how and why, but also ordinary everyday stories. So if you just think you can use them to illustrate your point, it's always about being, you know, clarity of message is is the key thing in the first place. I mean, and and that's you know, one of the steps I take my clients through being absolutely clear on what is the message If the audience, you know, sum it up in, in less than a sentence, really. Uh, what is that message you want your audience to take away? And then what of your little backstories? It could be absolutely anything. It could be something that happened in your childhood. It could be something that happened when you were on holiday. Um, just triggering you know it's the kind of stories that when you get together with a group of old friends and somebody will say oh do you remember that time we did this and that you triggers another story from somebody says oh yes and then there was that time we did that it's those kinds of stories um, obviously there has to be a purpose in sharing and the story has to illustrate something but you know it, it doesn't have to be these big big stories that illustrate resilience um, tenacity all those things uh, it, it, and the, and they're engaging and they can be amusing and yeah. and any and they are the stories that other people can relate to. It's kind of going going back to what I was saying that I used to feel quite um, letting myself off the hook by hearing the big story speakers, whereas somebody is sharing a story of you know how their dad caught them smoking on the high street when they were fifteen, kind of thing. You think, oh yeah, I, I, I had a story like that too, yeah. and you can see yourself in that person. And therefore, you can see that they've had this success and therefore you can think, well, actually, they're not so very different from me. It's all going on subconsciously. You're not actually thinking this, but therefore, if they can do it, maybe I can, too. Yes. We were talking earlier before we came on, on screen about uh, the I think the event that Marie and I first met, which is the PSA mm -hmm. London event. And I was actually very nervous speaking at that. I don't really get, you know, you always have the little butterflies in your stomach before you speak, yeah. but I wasn't really I don't even get nervous, super nervous. But I was a little bit nervous because it feels like you're speaking to your aunties <laughs> at those events, you know, they, they, yeah. uh, and also from, from a, a, a communicator's perspective, a presenter's, my usual way that I personally enjoy keynoting and presenting is using being, um, if we think about like story dynamics or, or, um, 
you know, uh, Campbell, all those kind of things. I think of myself as Yoda. I, I want to be, I want the audience to be Luke Skywalker. I want the audience to be the hero, not me. Okay. And so I tend to use stories more to kind of show inspiring examples of how the audience or how people I've worked with or case studies are the hero, not me. And I had to suddenly change in doing that one where Marie and I first met, flipped it completely around. So I had to talk exactly what you said, the why, why do I speak? What exactly what I'm doing? And it didn't feel particularly comfortable to me uh, doing that. So I guess uh, that's probably one of the benefits of, if anyone's a speaker just now speaking for your local, you know, your, your association, your speakers association, because you have to kind of work maybe some different muscles when you're speaking to that audience. I, I think you do, James. I mean, you know, everybody says, I mean, uh, as you said in my introduction, I'm a very active member of the London branch, but everybody says that although speaking to your speaker colleagues who all know what it's like, to be up there in front of an audience. So they're a very forgiving audience, but equally it's like, well, what can I teach them? You know, mm. I'm teaching them to suck eggs here. Um, so there is that extra anxiety, I think, of, of, of speaking in front of your peers, but equally it comes back to that thing that nobody else has your stories in exactly the way that you've experienced them. Even if, even if the three of us were to be somewhere um, and we told the story of the same event that we witnessed or took part in, we'd all tell it differently because we would experience it differently. Yeah. And I you were it's... fabulous, James. You were fabulous. You know you were. <laughs> no, no, but, but I, I guess it's, it's like you might have a, on in your bookcase, you might have all these different books on the same topic, but I resonate with that author, whereas my wife might resonate with another author. And they're basically yeah. talking about the same yeah, things the same stuff, but yeah. they're coming out from different life experiences, different perspectives, different takes, and that's quite exciting, I think, as a speaker because it means there's only one of you, so you have a unique voice, and it's sometimes just helping like someone like working with someone like you to find that voice as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always used to liken it to different teachers explaining how to do a, a thing, you know, maybe a maths problem. Mm. You could have somebody that is a really highly qualified teacher explaining it one way and you can't quite get it you can't quite get it somebody else will come along and explain it in a very slightly different way and you think oh yeah I mean actually I, I used to do quite a bit of windsurfing um I was never terribly terribly good at it but actually I was quite a good teacher for somebody who was behind me if you like because if you ask the people that are really really good at windsurfing who seemingly have just ever stepped onto a board and sailed off into the um, sunset, how they do that, that, that's all they'd be able to tell you is, you, well, you just hold your rig up and you step on the board and you go. And you think, no, it's not as simple as that. Yeah. When you've struggled yeah. with something, you, you know all the different steps that need to come together. So actually you're a better teacher for somebody Absolutely. that is brand new and isn't finding it that easy. Absolutely. Fabulous. So, Rachel, you've actually got a couple of uh, generous offers, haven't you, for our listeners? You've got a story hunt extravaganza, which you need to tell me about. Mm -hmm. And you've also got some videos. Can you tell us a bit about those two offers that you have? Yes. Yeah, so the story hunt extravaganza is a day of literally story hunting. Um, I, I'm doing that on Friday, the 12th of November. So that although it runs throughout the day, it starts at 9.30 and we finish up at about 3.30. It doesn't take the whole day. So how it works, we have a, a um, orientation call first thing, just introducing how the day is going to run. And then people go off and do a bit of their story hunting. I, I issue a story prompt guide and I suggest they go away and, and look at all the different prompts in there, come up with some stories from their past and then come back together for a couple of other calls throughout the day to share those stories. Um, it was great fun when I did the first one in July. People absolutely loved it because they said, oh, hearing somebody tell their story about when they were at school and, you know, something happened, that prompted my story. And that's exactly what happens. It's what I was talking about earlier with, you know, when you're with a group of old friends, the stories come pouring out. Um, so that's coming up on November the 12th. And at the moment, um, that's in pre-booking offer. So it's only £27 at the moment to take part in that Ooh. day. Um, value. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the full price is only 47 It is a, it, you know, it's a low cost 
thing because it, it, it's it's a light-hearted touch. It's just a fun day. Um, and I just want as many people to take part as, as possible because it, everybody needs new stories. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. you've also got a series of five short videos, yes? Yes, I have. And and those are, you can sign up for those via my website. It's a, Your Story Matters. And it's simply a series of five short videos. And each one addresses one of five common concerns that I hear people say, oh, but I, I don't want to tell my story because... Um, so it's aimed probably at people who are newer to speaking and certainly newer to sharing their story. So even if you are already doing a bit of probably not, you know, big stage speaking, but there's a lot of people that are confident speakers, perhaps within the business networking world, for example, um, that aren't actually sharing stories because there's, they're worried about something. So, yeah, they're, they're there to sign up for and, and they're completely free via the website. Lovely. James, there's a question for you very quickly, if we yes. can put that in, which so is I, from Jessica. Jessica. Did you see that? From yeah, Jessica? I just saw that. So Jessica Breitenfeld, uh, Team Whisperer, said, could you speak on the difference between motivational speakers and an expert who speaks? If James talks on innovation, how part of his, how much of his motivational stories make a part? Um, so I'll go first, but it'd be great. I'd love to hear Rachel's take on that as well. Motivational speakers, experts and, and Maria's. So um, I feel for me, motivation is a, is a, a flavor, is like a, 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 a filter that goes over across everything. I, I don't, I don't call, really call myself a motivational speaker. I think I'm an expert on creativity and innovation who speaks and I do it in a motivational way. That's just my take. But I know other people who have a much different view to me who are really motivational, motivational speakers who could kind of speak on anything very motivationally. But uh, that's just me, my, my take. I don't know, Rachel, what is your take on that difference between motivational speakers versus experts who speak? Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with you um, on that, James, because I get quite a few people will often say to me, uh, not just about the story aspect, but in terms of help with their presentations generally saying oh but I don't need you because I'm very confident in speaking but actually what they do is very confidently stand up there and share their expertise in a completely boring non-engageable way and for me the motivational speaker would not necessarily be super expert in, in an area although they probably are going to be but they're the speaker that engages with the audience, um, that, you know, peppers their stuff with, and what about you? How yeah. could you do this so that you do actually motivate? You, you could have a very dry expert who speaks, who isn't actually going to, informing, possibly, motivating, definitely not. So that, that would be my... Um, Maria, you've represented a lot of economists who you could argue are experts who speak. Who are a lot of them are brilliant, actually. So don't go down the route of being disparaging my <laughs> economist. I only work with brilliant speakers. So the question really is how much of the of the motivational stories make a part, the stories making a part. So I think it depends on who you are and what you're talking about. So, for example, Rand finds the whole of his speech are his stories and he you extract you extract the, the, the points from there. And I could listen to him tell his stories over and over again on a loop. Absolutely genius. And that but the when it's somebody who's an expert who speaks, if you like, um, I actually prefer the stories to be peppered in the same way that Rachel said. I don't want the story to be the main part and then you have to try and pull it out. Yeah. I want I want the different stories to 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 add. Uh, Jamil's very good at it, as you know. Jamil tells yeah. great stories. But what I also like, I like stories that have some humor in them because then mm -hmm. I want to tell them to other people. Um, and I want to remember them. But that thing on motivational speakers, if you think about it, because we often think about motivational speakers, you know, if I if we were to ask someone, think about who is the first motivational speaker they think of, they'll, they'll say like something like a Tony Robbins, perhaps. Um, but I, I, Greta Thunberg, who who did a speech this week, um, she landed a fantastic line, which she was she was talking about how the lack of governments doing things around environmental and making those changes, and she went, blah blah blah. That was the line. You know, these companies said they're doing blah, blah, blah. They're doing this blah, blah, blah. And it just repeated. So she was using re re repetition, which is a classic device of, of for speakers to use. She was motivating. She was pushing people to do something. Was she positive? You know, maybe not. 
So it's interesting how you can be motivational, but not necessarily have to be this kind of hyper up person mm. as well. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're rapidly running out of time. And I know both of you have a tip to share. So Rachel, let me go to your tip first. What is your tip or piece of advice you'd like to leave us with? It's to remember that, you know, if you're in that place of thinking, oh, actually, who wants to hear that story, that someone somewhere definitely does need to hear it and they need to hear it today because it's going to inspire them to make just one small positive change in their life. And who knows where that is going to lead? You know, we, we never know what that ripple in the water is going to lead on to. So that would be my advice to anybody who is just feeling that little bit hesitant about sharing stories. And I would say on that note as well, uh, some of my more experienced colleagues who have been speaking for a lot longer than I have, they say it's, it's, it's very nice where maybe 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, you have someone coming up to you, repeating a story that you said on stage, which you can't even remember and how that had an impact upon their life. Um, it's only just happening for me now. I'm, I'm not as experienced as a, <laughs> as a speaker. But um, uh, so my tool, I would say, of, of the week is this. I'm actually going to bend down and get it. This I'm going to make you bigger. Hang on. I'm going to make you bigger. Here. This there. is, oh, I don't know where they're getting. Okay. This is a, it's invented by a friend of mine. It's called an air turn. Uh, his, uh, his name's Henry Sung. And it actually got used by classical musicians when they're, they're doing their scores, when they had to change the, the, the music on their iPads. But you can also use it, a little trick. You can also use it to, for your PowerPoint to change your slides. And you can also use it like I'm using it just now. I'm using AutoCue uh, because... My memory is not that good. So um, so you ca I can now move the slides up and down. I can go back to different places and I, I can keep my hands free. I don't have to. Ooh, have I, want to one. I want one. So I want one. How much the, are they? This is about um, is about a hundred dollars in US dollars, about 80 pounds on Amazon. We'll put a link. People go to speakingbusiness.tv. They'll be able to get a link for that as well. And how easy is it to set up? Uh, I can set it up, so it must be easy. <laughs> no, you're quite techy. You're quite techy. There's, a, there's another question from Jessica, but I don't think we have time because I know, James, you're rushing off to deliver another presentation. So let's just leave it with how people can get in touch with you, Rachel, if they would like more information or to connect with you. Yeah, um, they can get in touch with me via my website or LinkedIn would be my um, social media platform of preference. I am on Facebook and have a very small presence on Instagram, but LinkedIn is probably the best one to get me on. Lovely. I'm going to leave the last word to you, James. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you, Rachel, so much. Uh, you've got me thinking now. I'm going to have to kind of go on a bit of a, a story hunt. I'm going to look for some new stories. You've got me inspired. So thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much. Maria, great to be back bringing the team back together again we'll see everyone again next week same time same place bye bye, bye, -bye.